God. So we're in Second Peter this evening, if you'd open your Bible there, Second Peter and chapter 1. There is a portion of this scripture that I have been very familiar with for many years concerning what are called in verse 4, the exceeding great and precious promises of God. But before we get to the precious promises at another time, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the word of God as it's opened before us tonight. We ask that you would give us uh, clarity of heart and mind concerning this precious faith. Precious because of who it rests in. Precious because of who it comes from. Precious because where it takes us from and where it takes us to. So precious because while it cost us nothing, it cost you and your son everything. And so we're thankful, Lord, for this precious faith. And as we consider it tonight, we pray that you would uh, meet with us and bless our time in the Word. We pray again for the children's ministry this evening and for Pastor Rick. We are excited for what you're doing in hearts and lives. We are so blessed and encouraged and strengthened in our walk with thee just through being here in camp for this time, for this season. We need times like this. We need one another to provoke one another unto love and good works to encourage and strengthen one another's hearts and hands for every good labour for your glory. Now bless our time, we pray and ask in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. Here in uh, Second Peter, there are three chapters where Peter begins speaking of the first things. The first things, and the first thing he speaks of is Christ and faith in Christ because the Christian life begins through faith in Christ. There would be no grounds for faith in Christ if there were not Christ. And so we have this very simple statement that takes us from this precious faith that we have obtained through the righteousness of God and our Saviour. And then he comes down into these exceeding great and precious promises that are there to guide and direct and deliver us, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then, of course, one of the first things of the Christian life is not just obtaining faith, but now growing in faith. And that's why it says, wherefore, uh, beside this giving all diligence in verse 5, add to your faith. Faith is not the end of the journey. It is the beginning of the journey. And uh, we are intended of God to grow in faith. When we read in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Now a lot of Christians, I think, in our fundamental churches know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. A lot of people seem to have missed out on Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, which tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God had a purpose in our salvation. You know, a lot of times when we talk about salvation, 
We talk about, yes, the destination that we're going to. We now have a, a home in heaven. We have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. We are sealed until the day of redemption. We have this blessed hope of the soon glories appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and he's coming to, to catch us away. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then we have the millennial kingdom, and then the final, uh, the final great wrath of God, falling on all men and the great white throne and then the new heaven and the new earth and we have a wonderful prospect we have all these things and so much more that God has planned for us but the problem is all of that is happening in the future it might be in an hour's time it might be in an, an, uh, later in the evening it might be tomorrow it might be next week it might be next month it might be next year it might be in the next century I mean we don't know all we know is that he is coming soon Paul looked forward in anticipation to the coming of Christ almost 2,000 years ago and so there has always been an expectation of his soon appearing. But God doesn't wear a watch. God doesn't carry around a calendar. He doesn't have a smartphone. I don't have a smartphone. I've got a dumb phone. But it, and, you know, and, and it has a calendar on it. And I keep an itinerary on it. But all the things that you and I may be planning and preparing pale into insignificance when we understand God has a plan. And God's plan is right on schedule, right on time. We need to understand that we've got to be involved for God. And that's what second, second, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 is telling us. God had a plan. When we came to Christ, he already had a plan in place. I say to people, imagine being there in heaven and God unveils this wonderful plan of redemption that he has there in the eternity past. And he puts it out there on display. And, and the Bible actually talks here in, in, in Peter, he says, he talks about things which the angels desire to look into and has the idea of wanting to get a clarity of understanding of, of how all this works, how it all is going to come together. I mean, in 1 Corinthians, we are told that the, the, the powers of darkness, if they had understood the teaching and the preaching and the prophecy of the Bible concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, what wouldn't have happened? They never would have crucified him. You see, Satan works by sight. He has no understanding of the realms of faith. He didn't believe it when Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. But when he has told his disciples over and over and over, you can follow it there. Beginning in Matthew chapter 16, he begins to tell them, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of the Gentiles. Uh, they're going to crucify him. They're going to kill him. And the third day he will rise again. And they did didn't believe it Satan didn't believe it multitudes today even this very day they'll celebrate resurrection Sunday and they still don't believe it I believe it God believes it and God provided it and so when these angels are looking at this plan they sort of say wow it's just awesome oh this is wonderful you're going to deliver men from the wrath to come? You know, many times we forget God not only saved us from hell to heaven, but God literally saved us from himself. Himself. God's holiness, God's justice demanded a penalty and a payment for our sin. That's what the cross was for. That's why it talks about atonement in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it uses the word propitiation. It settles the wrath of God. It satisfies God's demand for justice. Most of us know Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do we know the other verses that tell us that there, Jesus Christ is just and the justifier of all them that believe? He satisfies God's wrath and he meets the needs of men. Just and justifier. Two sides of the cross. On one hand, God's wrath. 
that is waiting for you and I. You've read it, have you not, in Ephesians 2 and verse 1 and 2, that we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. We're no different from anybody else in the world, folks. The only thing that makes a, an iota of difference for you and I concerning eternity is faith in Christ. And God being faithful to his promises concerning faith in Christ. And so the angel said, it's wonderful. Michael, what do you think? I'm, Lord, I'm gobsmacked. I can't get my head around it. My halo's almost bursting just trying to, to work it out. Uh, Gabriel, what do you think? He said, Lord, I'm so excited. I'm molting. <laughs> it's just... This is just too wonderful. This is the fullness of the grace, the mercy, the love, and the wisdom of God. And so God says, any thoughts? And one little angel lifts up his wing and says, what do you do with them after you've saved them? After they get saved, what then? And God went, and thought of that. Yea, he did. God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works. Not to get saved, but because we are saved. People that want to try and get saved by good works are condemned. Why? Because the more you do, the more you owe. Romans chapter 4. The Bible tells us. We'll look there for a moment in Romans chapter 4. It saved me trying to remember and quote it. It says there concerning Abraham, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God, in verse 2. For what saith the scripture? What we say this morning about 1 Corinthians 15? What does the scripture say? According to the scripture. What does the scripture say concerning the faith of Abraham? It says Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Now get this. Now the reward... Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Huh? To him that worketh, to him that's trying to work his way to heaven, the more you do, the more you owe. Why? Because God's salvation is free. It's a gift. It's a provision. It's available freely for all who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, when people get their religion, when people get their ritualism, when people get their ideas of, of sacrifices and sacraments and, and all kinds of ordinances and things that I have to do to get to heaven to somehow or other please God, you don't understand. You're not pleasing God. You're displeasing God. Because God says, remember the people came to Jesus? It's a long missed verse out of John's Gospel. The people came to Jesus having seen all the wonderful things he did, hearing the wonderful words he spoke, and they said, what work can we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus said, well, you need to come out door knocking with me. You need to sing in the choir <laughs> louder. Uh, you need to do this and do this. He said, no, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. When God says, I have provided the need of salvation through faith in my son. Jesus paid it all. It's done. I often say to people, imagine I go to your house for dinner. Where's my friend? <laughs> hey, Nick. Can she cook? Yeah, you're looking a little on the tubby side there. <laughs> She cooks well. Very good. So I go to Nick and Elisa's house and uh, the bear comes with me. Can't go anywhere. You see, you know what happens when the bear's not around? People have always say, you know, your husband's different when you're not around. <laughs> that's what happens when I'm unsupervised. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's my excuse. But anyway, so we go there for dinner one night and we're sitting down and we're having this lovely meal. And then at the end of the meal, I say, well, Nick, at least that was absolutely delicious. Here's five dollars. Hmm. They say, well, but you don't. No, 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 no. You don't, you don't I say, no, no, it's all right. Here's another five. <laughs> I said, brother, look, you know, it's, it's such a joy to have you in our home. 
Oh, praise God, here's another 10. <laughs> I'm insulting them. It might start out sounding funny, but if you did that, you are offending them. You know, when people, when God says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, when you choose to try and work your way to heaven, indulge in some religious activities to get heaven, you are offending God. You are sinning against God. Hence it says the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But the very next verse said, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted. Not his religion. Not his works. Not his clean living. His faith is counted for righteousness. You have faith in Christ. Right where you sit tonight, you either have Jesus Christ in your heart, in your life as your saviour, or you do not. There is no middle ground. I'm not nearly saved or I'm not getting saved. I am either saved or I am still dead in my trespasses and sins. And here is the wonder of it all, this thing that we call faith. Faith. Faith in Christ. Now, I want us to look at a passage tonight, one of the oldest passages in the Bible, concerning this issue of faith. We're here in Genesis and chapter 24. Genesis and chapter 24. And our scripture this evening concerns Abram and his servant Eliezer. It's a long chapter and we're not going to go over the whole chapter. We'll jump hither and thither to get to a particular point. But the beginning of the chapter says, And Abram was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abram in all things. And Abram said unto his eldest servant in his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife under my son of the daughters of Canaan, among whom I dwell. At this point in time, we can safely, I think, assume Abraham was dwelling in Beersheba. Beersheba is down the southern end of the land of Canaan, or as we call it today, the land of Israel. Abraham has come many years before, all the way from over near the Gulf, the, the, the Persian Gulf, in an area of Mesopotamia. He's travelled 900 miles from Ur the Chaldees up to Haran. And there from, from Nahor up to Haran, and then he's gone almost another 900 miles down to Beersheba and a little bit further down into Egypt, which was a bit of a pickle for a time. But well, actually, it still is a pickle. But anyway, that, that's another story. And so this servant is commanded by Abram to make this vow, to enter into this vow, and he gives him a promise when uh, the man says to him, you know, what about, and he, Abraham says in verse 7, Under thy seed I will give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. You've got to go all the way back to my original hometown, and when you get there, God has a young woman for my son. Now his wife Sarah was 127 years old when she died. This is a couple of years after that. And so here we have this young man who is brideless and now he's going to get himself a wife. Maybe these people do it the right way. Maybe we should just sign contracts with people and, and send servants out to bring somebody back. But he says, no, you, you do this in a way. Now, verse 10 says, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. And he went all the way, we're told. He arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. That's, that's Abram's brother. So you get all the way... Now, we've got all the goodies. We've got a few other servants coming along. And we've got the camels laden up. I mean, we're going to travel. Well, folks, we're talking about over 2,000 kilometres. I don't know what the time of year was. But I know that in this area of the country, it gets stinking hot and it gets freezing cold. It can be snowing or it can be blazing hot. And there's no toll roads, praise God for that. 
In fact, there's no roads. <laughs> you, just, you just went. And you went out knowing whither you went, and you went it. And away he went. Now, this would have taken, this is a journey that would have taken months. Months and months. And yet the scripture tells us that when he gets there, he finds a young woman. And he says, as he's holding his peace, he says, Lord, let it be, in verse 12, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. What do you think the motive was for asking things to get done quickly? Was he homesick? Was he keen to go back on the road again? I mean, we've already got here. Let's just get a day's rest, catch our breath and turn around and go back. He said, let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I'm, I pray thee that I may drink, and she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let this same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Wow. The faith of this little servant man, the oldest servant in his house. Now, I'm not the oldest person in this room. I'm pretty sure there might be a couple of others older than me, and it ain't you. <laughs> Two, sir, I think you're a couple of years older than me. <laughs> uh, Julian, you're definitely older than me. <laughs> but this man has gone all this distance, weathering it all, and he gets there and his simple prayer is, Lord, let there be one girl that comes and if I ask her for a drink, she'll say, yes, I'll draw for you and I'll draw for your camels. Girls, girls, you're looking for a hobby? Grab a water pot. <laughs> Find somebody with 10 cam 10 camels. Can you imagine what it must have been? This woman is amazing. I mean, long before we had Wonder Woman, we had this woman. This young slip of a girl, and she's going to take out drink from the well for the servant, and I guess for his servants as well, and for the camels. Excuse me, have you seen camels drink? <laughs> After months on the road... Stopping at muddy little waddies and oases along the way. And here we are at a well of this beautiful, sweet, fresh water. And this little teenage girl, she's got her big bucket there and she's just pouring it in. And no sooner has she emptied it out and the trough's empty again. I mean, what a worker. But this was an amazing answer to prayer. Now, there's three things that I, that I have observed about this man, this servant. And I, I'm... I'm amazed. I mean, surely somewhere along the road, you've got to be thinking to yourself, this is nuts. We're, we've been gone for 10 weeks and we're not even halfway. We're not even halfway to Iran. What? 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 Don't bring a wife back from the daughters of Canaan. Go all the way to my father's house. Who cares? Let's just find a woman. Let's go down the market and buy one. Better get a good looking one or that'll really upset the boy. But, you know, <laughs> let's just get it done. This man had his master's burden on his heart. His concern for Abram and Isaac is astounding. What an amazing testimony of surrender and service this is. What a sacrificial spirit this man has. And then we find this man, when he finally gets into the company of the family, he's bowed his head and worshipped. He's praising God. And says in verse 27, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Imagine that of all the women that could have turned up at the well right at that moment as he prayed, this one came. 
right on time. God's provision. And so Rebecca came out. And here, God had a plan. Rebecca had a brother. Mm. Oh, Laban. <laughs> She came home and said, hey, listen, there's a servant from Abram's house. He came down. He wasn't listening to a word she said. He saw the golden earring. Wow. And she said, this is man down at the well. And he saw the bracelets. And he ran. Probably never been to the well in his life. That's woman's work. <laughs> but he took off running and he got there and oh, he all of a sudden, he's spiritual. You know, come thou blessed of the Lord in verse 34. Why standest thou without? For I have prepared the house. When did he prepare the house? It's woman's work. He wouldn't be preparing the house. You know, I'm, you know and, I, and I've got room for your camels. Oh, that's what I want. I want a motel room where I can keep my camels with me. I've been living with these stinking camels for about 10 months, and now you want me to spend the night with the camels in the room. That's great. And then he said, he set meat before him, and he said, I will not eat until I have told you mine errand. And he said, speak on. And so he goes through and he rehearses. Now, he had his master's burden on his heart. We, we read through here and we find that he has his master's message on his lips. He didn't make up some story. He told everybody here exactly why he had come, who had sent him, what he was going to do, what he was meant to do, and he gave God the glory for having prospered his way. And by the way, whose gifts did he give to the girl? And by the way, he gave gifts to Laban and to all the family. But whose gifts were they? Abram's. His master's burden on his heart, his master's message on his lips, and his master's gifts in his hands. You know what this is? This is a picture of the child of God serving Christ. This is what we're meant to be doing. We should have the burden of our master on our heart to go and fetch the bride for the Son of God. That's what the church is, isn't it? A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb is, a marriage supper for the Lamb and His bride. And all the things that we possess, everything we possess, we have received by grace and mercy at the hand of our gracious Saviour. What an amazing testimony hidden away in the first book of the Bible. And so he gives them the message. And then the delay sets in. They said, you know, in verse 51, Behold, Rebecca is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abram's servant heard the words, he worshipped the Lord bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. And he gave also to her brother, the rat Laban, and to her mother precious things. God's given us some precious things, hasn't he? It says, And they did eat and drink, and he and the men that were with him, and they tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least, at the least ten, and after that she shall go. Oh, yeah. Laban, Laban, Laban. Oh. He's a pagan. He's an idol worshipper. You'll find him later on in the book of Genesis having a tiff. And his own daughter stole his idols hit him in her stuff and sat on him. That's how good these gods of the hands of men are. Stolen, sat on, speechless. The Bible speaks of them as dumb idols. They have eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, mouths that can't speak, feet that can't walk. 
And yet after all Laban had seen God do in the life of Rebekah and Abram and Isaac, he wanted his gods back. How many times have you and I ever been tempted to go back to our old gods? Go back to the old pig pen that God pulled us out of. Dive back into that morass, that, that miry clay that he plucked us from when he lifted us up and set our feet on a rock and put a song in our heart, even praise unto our God. And we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to the world. We want to go back to the pig pen. Uh, it happens too often, doesn't it? It's one of the things we're burdened for with children and grandchildren and our youth, our young people. It, it's such a heartache when you see potential. Every one of these young people have enormous potential to glorify God. But then you see that old devil sticks a hook through their nose like a Babylonian heathen and drags them off into captivity. Now, unfortunately, many of us have gone and we went willingly. But he said, hinder me not. Verse 56, hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. That's unusual. Many of us understand the culture of the old moon worshippers. Women don't speak. Women just do as they're told. Women, women are a chattel. They're a possession. They're not a person. That's the culture of these people. And here, they said, oh, we'll ask her. Oh, this is beautiful. They, they called Rebecca and they said unto her, wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Let me ask you, isn't that what faith is? The scripture tells us in Hebrews 11.6 that without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is faith when this young lady says, you know, this required faith. Has she ever seen Isaac? She's the daughter of his long lost brother. I mean, she's never even seen Abram. Unless he... Her dad carried a photo of Abram in his wallet or something. He said, oh, by the way, there's a little family sh snapshot last time Abram came home on holiday. And that's me up the back. No! She had to believe everything the servant said about this boy. Wilt thou go with this man? That requires faith. And that's exactly what every person that comes to Christ does. Have you seen Jesus? Read about him, heard about him, got a lot of thoughts about him. The first time I, before I was even saved, I'm reading this little, uh, this ugly little good news New Testament. And I'm flipping through there reading the, these gospels. I'm thinking, wow, oh, that's cool. Ah. You know what happens when you're reading a book? You want to know how the story ends. So by the time you finish the Gospels and you start reading these other bits and pieces, like, uh, uh. so I jump over in the book of Revelation, eh? I want to find out how it finishes. Swords coming out of mouths, giant locusts in the smoke, and, and I'm thinking, Isaac Asimov's got nothing on these guys. This is science fiction at its best. I didn't understand a thing of it. All I knew of Christ was what God was revealing in my heart. And when I heard the gospel preached, I could see it. At first it was a misty, foggy sort of thing. But as I listened to the word of God and resolved in my heart to obey the word of God, to obey the gospel, it was a simple step of faith. It required for her, it required faith. For you to come to Christ, it'll require simple faith. There's another element of it will require forsaking all she already has. This is her world. 
This is her world, way down here in this little town or wherever it is, way down the bottom near the, near the Persian Gulf there, at the, at the, way down the, 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 the southeast end of, the, of Mesopotamia, all the way down there, that's all she's known all her life. Her family, her friends, all of her dreams over the years have all been built around what she can see. And she's got to let go of all that to lay hold on this which faith promised. This man, this man who would love her, this man who would care for her, who would provide for her, who would protect her, this man that she's never seen. That requires faith, that requires forsaking all. You know why multitudes of people never ever come to a saving knowledge of Christ? You read it there in Revelation chapter 21, the fearful and unbelieving. They're fearful. I can't let go of my church. I can't let go of my baptism. You know, I got baptized so that I could go to heaven. Baptism doesn't save. Oh, my clean living. Oh, listen, young people, I tell them all the time, clean living will keep you out of trouble, will keep you out of jail, but it won't keep you out of hell. There's got to be forsaking of all. Give up my church. Give up my religion. Give up my rituals. I'm going to have to turn my back on everything that I've already believed for maybe for decades. I've thought, well, this is, this is how God works. I've got it all sorted out. And realize, no, I don't. No, I don't have it all sorted out. I'm a sinner. I cannot make atonement for myself. I can't pay the debt. I have a debt that I could never pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. Jesus paid it all. Faith. Forsaking all. And then finalising right away. Wilt thou go with this man? She said, I will go. She didn't say, well, come back. You know, I think Laban's got a good idea here. Maybe you'll wait 10 days or a few, 20 days, 30 days. Done. It's finished. We're doing this. That's a challenge. To lay hold on eternal life. To know the Spirit of God by the Word of God has brought a reality and a clarity of the need of the finished work of the Son of God for my sin, for my salvation, that I might become a child of God, not because of what I've done, but because Jesus did it all. Faith. Isn't it profound that when you read that again, Wilt thou go with this man? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We make, people today make faith such a convoluted, complex... It, it's a mess. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came into the world to take your sin, my sin, our sin, the sins of the whole world, that all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all? I believe that. I believe that the first time I heard it preached 45 years ago. I'm still believing it. As the hymn writer said, my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall plead. Oh, it's wonderful to know your sins are forgiven. It's wonderful to know that the Spirit of God knocked on the door of this old heart and came in. But by faith, you open the door. No one else can do it for you. You open the door. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you for this precious faith. As you've declared here in your word, as Peter writes to those who along with him, multitudes of others, down through the centuries, 
have obtained the righteousness of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, how thankful we are for the simplicity of the salvation you have provided. Lord, our prayer tonight is for that one or ones here who have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, have never trusted, are not trusting Christ and Christ alone. Oh, the peril of Jesus and the church, Jesus and the ritual, Jesus and the good things, Jesus and the money. It's Christ and Christ alone. For neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation by a person at a price for sinners such as we are. Salvation by faith according to the riches of your grace. Lord, thank you for the testimony of this servant of Abram, Eliezer. His master's burden on his heart, his master's message on his lips and his master's gifts in his hands and a fruitful mission accomplished to bring home a bride for the master's son. And that's what you're calling your children to do today. For those that know Christ as Saviour, we're to be bringing home the bride to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ. We need that burden on our heart for them that do not know the Saviour, that do not know Christ. We need that message on our lips and uh, we cannot do it in our own strength, but we're thankful that by your word and your spirit, we have the gifts of God already to faithfully serve you. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to hearts tonight and challenge us in our walk with thee. Thank you again for all of your grace and all of your goodness. 